Welcome to the Land Geek Podcast, your resource for information and tips to making money by buying and selling land. Let the Land Geek show you how to make a passive income by working smart, not working hard. Learn strategies and tricks to make money buying and selling raw land today. And here is the man that's going to help you do that, the Land Geek. Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, the Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And I hope you've got yourself in a situation right now where you're just very pumped up for my special guest because this is really special. Uh, I, you know, again, I know I've used this in the past, but he's kind of a big deal. And he's really doing an unbelievable job of paying it forward with his expertise, knowledge of all things. That's right. Your favorite niche, my favorite niche, raw land. This is Seth Williams, the author of the amazing blog, retipster.com, land investor extraordinaire. And I have to say it's kind of boring, but he's also a commercial real estate banker. Seth Williams, welcome to Land Geek Podcast. How are you? Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. No, I, I'm really, I'm pumped to be here, pumped to be part of this. I, I just kind of discovered your podcast not long ago, and I've listened to a few episodes, and it's all been really, really good. I know there's, there's not a ton of really good info out there for people in this niche, and I think you're just, you're doing an awesome job of making a lot of good information available. So nice work. Thanks, I appreciate. It. Do, you, do you have any, you know, constructive criticism? What, what should I be? What should I? Be, how should I make this better? You know. So far, I've only listened to episodes one, seven, and your previous one with Jim Lewis, I think was his name. Oh, yeah, the Craigslist um, one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, man, I'm trying to think. Um, I really can't think of anything big. If I think something, though, I'll, I'll shoot you an email. But, I mean, I, it's just been, been really, really good so far. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. And, yeah. um, you know, not to suck up, but I really love the blog, which sure. we'll, t- we'll talk about. So yeah, thanks. Let's, uh, let's talk about all things Seth Williams. Shall we? Do sure, let's do it. Do you mind if I ask some really personal, hard-hitting questions? Um, if I mind, I just won't say anything. All right. So let <laughs> me no, ask you this. How, how do you – you've been doing this for a while, right? How long have you been buying and selling raw land? Well, I've been doing the land thing for about five, five and a half years now. Five, five and a half years. And yeah. so how do you typically find your deals? Sure. Uh. Well, most of my deals are found through direct mail. That's kind of been the, the sort of, I guess, the main way that I've been doing it by sending mail out to people who have delinquent property taxes. That's right. kind of the the main hit. Though over the past couple of years, I've sort of migrated a little bit um, to collecting leads through my, my website and kind of trying to pull in a lot of traffic from Google and places like that. Right. Which has been it's been nice because I don't really have to pay for those leads. They just kind of come in, and I can sort of work with them. Um, but I think the downside of that is I don't really get to target people as well. It's just kind of luck of the draw, and you never know what you're going to get, and right. you never you never really know why people are trying to sell. So it's it's different from that angle, but it's nice that you know the leads are just sort of coming in on their own. Right? So. Do you do you ever get the nasty voicemail when you make an offer? Do you get that? Yeah, a lot. Yeah. Or well, I don't, know if, I don't know if it's a lot, but um, I. I do. I have definitely gotten some nasty feedback, and usually when I when I get those, I've got a little folder on my computer where I kind of save those audio files, and I can just sort of go back to them and listen when I when I want a good laugh. <laughs> right, right. So it's. A, I mean, you just kind of have to shrug it off and not take it personally. But um, yeah, I, I'm familiar with that for sure. Yeah, for sure. And you know, what's interesting is that I use uh, Google Voice to okay. screen those calls, but I actually have another coaching student. And it was really interesting the way that he kind of set that up. So he bifurcated his two businesses, right? Because he didn't want the people send, that he was sending out offers to to start slamming his main business, mm. right? Now, I don't do that. What do you, do you like that approach? So there's like the Seth Williams investor side of it. And then there's the RE tipster side of it that might be selling land. So mm-hmm. the people, so they don't, so the people that you're buying from don't see you as, you know, don't see the selling entity. Do you like yeah. that idea? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I was always kind of concerned about that too. Uh, maybe I was overly concerned about it. I don't know, but I, because of that, I kind of went to great lengths in, you know, when I was creating websites and putting together my postcards and things like that, where, 
you know, I, I would leave out my last name or, you know, my, my, uh, buying website and my selling website have no links back to each other there's really no correlation between the two so it almost kind of I, I try really hard to just sort of manage what people see and what they know about me you know when i'm sure. wearing each hat just so that there is you know hopefully not a lot of crossover there right right but you know okay your full-time job you're mm-hmm. working 40 hours a week as a commercial real estate banker correct yeah that's correct okay so how many hours a week are you working on the blog and actually doing deals sure no that's that's a great question i think um it's it's certainly been a challenge and that's kind of it's kind of what i try to get at in the blog is, is sort of explaining to people how how i managed to do that how i managed to you know do a 40 hour week or more and you know get time in for blogging and get time in for the land business and get time in for all these other things in my family and my wife and i mean it, it can certainly be a challenge but uh, it really has a lot to do with uh, just being very intentional about what you spend your time on. And, uh, for example, the time with my wife. I mean, if I have to, I'll put an appointment in my calendar saying, spend time with my wife. <laughs> you know? Right, right. But basically just, I mean, uh, elevating that to a priority that's above everything else. Uh, and, I mean, if you're really serious about it, I mean, you can figure it out. But it just it takes a little bit more effort and, I guess, mental energy to manage that. Right, right. So, what was it about about land that attracted you versus you know everyone's flipping sure. single family homes, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I mean, that's kind of what I wanted to do at first. Uh, back when I was just getting out of college, and I just, I just knew I wanted to do something with real estate. It just seemed so cool to me, and I spent so much time. This was back in like two thousand six ish. Right. I, I would just spend like hours and hours and hours and hours trying to find a good real estate deal, something that would actually make sense on paper. I mean, based on the asking price that people were asking for, and I just couldn't do it. And I even I would I would send offers to people through my real estate agent at the time. And the thing was, it's like if there was ever a good deal on the MLS, it was gone like that. Like right. it was, and usually it would sell for 10 grand and more than the person's asking price. It was just, it seemed like a hopeless situation that I could never really get on the inside and get a good deal. Right. And, um, and eventually, you know, I, I learned about the whole land business and, and how that works and how you can reach out to motivated sellers. And man, I mean, once, once I, I kind of saw it for myself, and you know, I guess the first direct mail campaign where I, I think I only sent out a hundred postcards just to kind of test the waters. And, you know, I got six calls back and I mean, I would send just these stupid offers to people for like a hundred bucks or something like that. And, right, right. and, and people like, people were like seriously considered it. And I mean, people said yes. And, it just it blew my mind that I was trying so hard to get these houses and just competing so fiercely with everybody else out there when all, all along there are these deals that are like almost free for all intents and purposes and they're just there for the taking if you know where to look. Yeah, so, a- yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Do, you, do you have – now, where do you do most of your business? Like, yeah. Do you have a certain area that you like to focus on? You're mm-hmm. in Michigan, correct? Yep, I'm in Michigan, uh, in Grand Rapids, over on the west side of the state. Okay, and so you're you're on the wealthy side of the state. <laughs> well, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Just depends on your neighborhood. <laughs> right. um, basically, yeah. I mean, my first couple, probably two or three years, I just sort of had this uh, had this impression in my mind that I could only buy stuff that was that I could drive to and see myself. That was all I was comfortable doing. Right. And. I could certainly find deals doing it that way. There was nothing particularly the wrong with it, but it was kind of, uh, I eventually figured out it was kind of limiting myself unnecessarily. Sure. Um, it happened, I think it was in 2011. Um, I was able to get a property under contract. Uh, it was about five hours away up in Northern Michigan, right by the Mackinac bridge. Okay. And it, it was a it was a twelve acre parcel of land right on Lake Huron with about five hundred feet of beach frontage. Oh nice. And I was like, this is insane. Like this there's no way I can get this for less than like three hundred thousand dollars. There's just no way. Right, right. Um but I, I didn't have that kind of cash. Um and not not anywhere close to that at the time. And uh so what I did just my my policy at that point was to just literally send offers to anybody, regardless of what they told me or you know what they said they were willing to accept. 
And so I did that, and I sent uh, this person an offer for forty five hundred bucks, and <laughs> and she accepted it. And I I was just now like, why would she accept it? You, you know, do you even know it, the story? I I kind of figured out a little bit of the story along the way. It was kind of a lesson to me that when you're making offers to people, it has a lot to do with understanding what their problem is and understanding what they need. And in her case, she didn't really need money. It wasn't about money to her. It was about getting a really bad memory and a really bad nuisance out of her life. Because her story was that she had bought that property with her husband and her husband left her and just, I mean, I don't know all the intricate details, but it was pretty pretty bad situation i think and sure she just had a lot of negativity associated with that and she wanted it gone and i kind of just happened to be there at the right time and i was i was there to make it very quick basically like immediate alleviation from her pain right <laughs> and um and i mean she she acknowledged to me i know this is a ridiculous price but i really want this out of my life so i'm gonna do this and uh, and it was great for me, and I ended up uh, selling it a couple of months later for forty five thousand wow. um, dollars, and and that was actually like a really low price for that kind of thing. I I, I was kind of freaked out at the, at the moment because it literally ate up you know a lot of my cash that I had at the time, and I'm like you know I got to get this thing sold, and I, but it, I mean, it was just kind of goes to show you the the kinds of opportunities that are out there if you're looking in the right place and if you're persistent. I mean that kind of stuff. It, it comes along, you know. You just have to be in the game and and working at it. Oh yeah, it's, yeah. The the deals are unbelievable. I mean, yeah. people people that are on the outside of it don't even understand. And when I try to explain to them, you know, that I bought a piece of property for, you know, a hundred dollars, five acres, they're like, whatever. Like mm -hmm. they don't even believe me. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, it's it's crazy. Yeah, it's I, crazy. I think it almost it, it just sounds so unreal, unrealistic. That's like they can't even really let it sink in, so they sort of dismiss it. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah exactly. I agree. And most people can't get their heads around the concept of raw land, mm -hmm. right? Like, what do you do with it? How? What value does it have? What? You know, most people I think think of you know when you think of land ownership, you think of guys like Bezos and Ted Turner. You think of billionaires that yeah. buy up these big tracks and they turn them into income producing types of investments and do that as opposed to what we do, which is more opportunistic, which is solving someone's problem and mm -hmm. then turning that around, flipping it and creating an opportunity for someone else that may not have ever been able to afford land. Mm -hmm. So it, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. But yeah, I, I've always loved that about this is that, I mean, it's all about finding the right people, both on the buying end and the selling end. And when you do that, it's like you truly do solve everybody's problems along the way. I mean, right. if if you're working with the right people, I mean, you you solve the seller's problem because they're out, they're, they have the problem off their lap. You're solving the county's problem because they're getting their taxes paid up current, and you're selling you know the buyer's problem because you're giving them an amazing opportunity. It's like you're really kind of everybody's hero. Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So it's it's just. I never would have looked at it that way beforehand, but once I've been through it so many times, it's like, man, this is just a really cool kind of business to be in. Right, right. I actually went to a, a county once, and mm -hmm. they had like a thousand properties in, uh, in like they, they just had in their in their in their system, right? They mm -hmm. couldn't even, like people they couldn't even auction them off. And I went there. And I said, look, if I sell these for you, even if I sell them for a dollar, and they pay the back taxes. It's all free money to everybody. Mm -hmm. Everyone wins. Yeah. And and they're like, oh, I, I guess you're right. I'm like, because sitting right here, no no one's getting anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a huge problem, and, and we solved it. But it turned out that, uh, you know, I bought all these in 2007, and then mm -hmm. 2008 hit. So yeah. I ended up, you know, making a little money on the deal. But it, it wasn't like the grand slam that I thought it was going to be. Yeah. But that's a whole other story. Mm -hmm. So, all right. So let me ask you this. What percentage of your deals are ca are cash flips, and what percentage of your deals do you do uh, land notes in order financing? Sure. Well, I think uh, I pretty much almost always offer seller financing unless the deal is just like really, really cheap, and it kind of just doesn't make sense to go through the trouble of that. Um, or, or if for some reason I just I need more cash now, then I, I won't. But 
nine times out of ten, I want to offer some kind of seller financing as part of the deal. Right. Uh, and it uh, it really it opens up a lot of doors for a lot of people, a lot of seller, or, excuse me, a lot of buyers who otherwise wouldn't even be able to consider it because they can't get financing or they just don't have all the money. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely a huge huge tool. Right. Right. Now, do you typically try to get your all your money out on the down, or are you more flexible? Yeah, I mean, I think it's. I mean, obviously, that's preferable if I can, but sure. um, I, it's not like I'm not going to do it if I can't. Um, right. uh, for example, like there's a, a deal I have in Alabama right now that I bought a few months ago. Um, it was, it's probably it's actually the first deal I've bought successfully with my Roth IRA, which has been kind of interesting to see how that process works. But um, I got it for I got it for forty five hundred bucks. It's worth probably in the vicinity of. Forty to fifty thousand, something like that, maybe, sure. maybe more. Um, and I, I'm offering seller financing on that one. And literally every single person who has called has been interested in the seller financing piece. If I hadn't been offering that, I'm, I, I don't know, who knows how many how many serious callers I would get. Right. So it, it's a it's a. I mean, people definitely take notice of that, and it's a very important factor that they take into their decision making process. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So let me ask you this: when you first started out in the business, mm -hmm. where, what were your biggest struggles? So considering you've been doing this as long as you have, can you even think back and, and think, okay, where did I kind of hit the wall here or hit the wall there? And then how would you fight through that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Uh, I think just initially, um, probably kind of a few different stages I went through. Initially, it was just, I get just learning. I mean, there's just, there's so much to learn. Like I, I just didn't, I mean, even with my background in commercial real estate banking, there was still so much I had to learn about, you know, how to get lists and how to, how to market to them and how to talk with sellers and how to make the offers. And it was just, it just seemed like an endless thing. It probably took me a, a solid a year just to, I guess, learn all of this stuff and then also kind of get my business infrastructure up and rolling, like, you know, like a, a mailbox and a business computer and the, the LLC and all this stuff. So that was the first kind of struggle, just sort of, not that it was like that hard, but it just took a lot of time to to do that. Sure. And then and then the next stage that I hit was probably like a year and a half, two years into it, when I was really hitting direct mail really really hard, just sending out like hundreds of postcards every week, and occasionally I would get like a dry spell for like a month or two where just like nobody was responding, and it just felt like it, it felt like something had shifted in the market or I was just doing something very, very wrong because nobody was calling me. <laughs> right. I, I shouldn't say nobody. I just mean, you know, a fewer, a fewer, uh, lesser response rate. And it was just, it was really discouraging to go through that and just to think like, man, like, should I just get out of this? Like, should I quit? I mean, I, I seriously was thinking about giving up at that point because it was just really hard for me to financially commit to those direct mail campaigns and get nothing. Um, and it, I kind of, what I when I figured out what I, was, I was going to was kind of a statistical drive spell. It, it's um, <laughs> what what ended up happening there was I, I kept going and a couple of months later I just got slammed with all these calls and all these acceptances and it's kind of like you know if you if you do something for a long enough time if you take a big enough sample of the market I mean it will kind of even itself out and that's kind of what happened and sure. I wouldn't I wouldn't have experienced that upswing on the back end if I had given up so um, it was really just uh, sort of to me underscore the importance of first of all I guess figuring out what you're doing and what kind of uh, strategy works and then sticking to it and not giving up when you hit the first sign of trouble right um, and yeah I mean it's I, I know I mean anybody who's an entrepreneur knows that I mean, there are definitely down times in any business when it, it gets hard and it, it can get very trying, but it has everything to do with your level of persistence and your willingness to just, just keep going, you know, keep at it. You know, you've got a solid strategy, so don't give up. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I, I'll sometimes get an email from a coaching student and they'll hit a wall with a county and yeah. they can't get the list or the treasurer won't give them a good list. Mm -hmm. And I say to them, look, you can look at this one of two ways, right? Number one is that, okay, I'm going to pass on this county and go somewhere else. That might be easier. And there's nothing wrong with that. But the other way to look at it, at it is this is an amazing opportunity because if you're hitting this wall, so is everybody else. Yeah. And if you can fight through it and if you can figure out a creative way to get that information, 
who owes those back taxes in that area, who else is doing it? Mm-hmm. Nobody else wants to go through that brain damage. So yeah. it's a huge opportunity that you could take advantage of. Just fight through it. Mm-hmm. Embrace the suck, so to speak. That yeah. uncomfortable feeling of not really, you know, things not coming that easily. And then sure enough, you're going to get to the other side of it and you'll be the guy with mm-hmm. all those deals or gal, I should say. But um, yeah, so you, but you yeah. agree with that. No, there's there's a ton of truth to that. I, that's that's it's not always easy to look at it that way, but it's it really is true. I mean, if you can, when when you hit those problems and those, I guess, failures for lack of a better word, like it really is a good thing. It's a blessing in disguise because it it shows that you know if you've got the the, the I guess the will to keep going, and if you can figure that out, man, you're you're so far above anybody who would be your competition. <laughs> exactly. And, yeah. and, and to be honest, I mean, look, how many people in the country are even doing this? I mean, there's not a lot of competition. Yeah, there's really not. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I've, I've, I really don't think I've ever even heard of a competitor in my market ever doing this. So, which just kind of goes to show you, I mean, I, I, I think with almost any business, you expect some kind of competition and I, I don't really see it. So, Right, right. I mean, there's just more deals than there are competitors. Yeah. I mean, it's just it's just so much out there. Mm-hmm. That, Absolutely. And and the nice thing about this is that we're in this niche where you know the billion dollar private equity groups are never going to play. Mm-hmm. It's it's just not going to be their area mm-hmm. of focus ever. Yeah. And so it's always going to be sort of this cottage industry in a sense. I mean, mm-hmm. there are bigger players out there, and you can form a syndicate. But even if you have a ten million or twenty million dollar syndicate. That's it's still it's like a really small fraction of what you can buy out there. Would you agree? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, absolutely. And kind of going back to what you were saying earlier, uh, I like whenever you try to explain this sort of business to people, and you just sort of see their eyes glaze over, or they don't get it. It's like I'm like, okay, <laughs> that's that's fine. I mean, I I don't have any problem with having no competitors. So. Right, right, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So. Um, I know you're a big tech guy, and I'm a big tech guy. That's why I call myself the land geek. Sure. So, what what cool tools are you using today? Like, do you, do you have any kind of like favorites, technology yeah. wise? I mean, yeah, I, you know, we always talk about like the tip of the week, mm-hmm. but I'm sure you got tons of them. And if you go to the blog, there's tons of them there. But just in general, how do you kind of use technology to automate your business and mm-hmm. eliminate a lot of the busy work? Yeah, I think uh, a really big light bulb for me um, a couple of years ago was when I I put together. Uh, it took me a while to do this, but I finally put together my first. I call it a buying site, and it's really just a website. It's a few very basic pages. There's not a lot to it, but um, one of these pages is like a 15 or 20 question form where people just fill out their property information and they submit it to me. And it's it's what I was mentioning earlier, how I get a lot of leads through my website. Sure. And, and prior to that, the way that I would get this information from people was, you know, they would leave me a voicemail. I would have to call them back, sometimes play phone tag. We'd finally get on the phone. I'd have to listen to them, you know, yak for 30 minutes and tell me their life story. And sure. It was, it was um, I mean, it was just kind of par for the course. That's just how it worked. And, I mean, that's that's okay. I mean, I was still able to do business that way and get deals done. But it just it consumed so much time, and what I what I found through this uh, this website that I made, I paid somebody a few hundred bucks to do do some SEO work for me, and sure. just sort of optimize things and throw links all over the place, and um, they were successful at getting me to like like two or three uh, on on Google when you search for certain terms that I was targeting. Sure, and and as a result, I was getting you know I think I've actually slipped down in Google since then because I, I haven't really. I haven't really kept up with that, but, um, but I mean, at the, at the most, I was probably getting like three or four submissions a day. Now I'm probably getting like one a day on average. Um, and the nice thing is when they submit this stuff, I mean, it tells me everything and I can just read it in an email in a matter of seconds rather than talking to them on the phone for, you know, hours, <laughs> hours on end. And, um, a cool little thing that I did in my form was I actually put two drop down questions where I, I force them to tell me how motivated they are to sell. Like right. I actually have them say, you know, either on a scale of one to five, I'm willing to sell this right now. I don't care what you offer me, you know, just send me an offer versus 
I'm not that motivated. I'll only accept 100% of market value, that kind of thing. Right. And what that did was it, it just told me right up front without me having to guess how motivated they were. And I could use that to say, I'm either not going to send you an offer or I am and I'm going to keep it near the higher end of things or I am and I'm going to make this incredibly low because you told me flat out you don't care. <laughs> right. So right. it's uh, – and basically what what I've done is I've I've even reset my voicemail system now to tell people to go to the website. Like don't leave me a voicemail. Just go to the website and fill it out there. <laughs> and and basically it's it saved me hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours because I, I just it's a lot of conversations I don't have to have now. So. Right. Right. I I love that strategy. I do things a little bit differently. I think you know. I just yeah. send out lowball offers because mm-hmm. I don't want to talk to anybody. Yeah. But um I do like that approach. Yeah, and, uh, I, yeah I, I think it's great. I, I think there's there's a lot of different philosophy. So, well, ah, excuse me, philosophies out there. I don't think any of them are really wrong. I mean, if they work right. for people, then they work. Yeah, I um, mean, success I, is success. Yeah, I, I mean, I had a mentor one time who who basically refused to do anything through email. He had to talk to everybody and develop that personal connection before they do anything. And and I mean, he was really successful doing it that way. I personally, that's it's just too much time for me. I don't, I don't really want to waste all my time doing that. So, right. But yeah, I mean, I mean, it's there's, I guess it just goes to show that there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat, and you know, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, are there any other in, other areas of uh, or other niches that you're looking at as far as investing and, and learning about? Yeah, I um, something I've been trying to direct more of my funds towards uh, in the past couple of years is, is buying just rental properties, just kind of the, the, you know, bread and butter thing that a lot of people do. Uh, and I've, I've been able to uh, basically siphon off the cash that's generated from the land business and sort of plug it into that. And, and I, I kind of go into it with the mindset of, I want nothing to do with the management of this. I don't even want to know who the tenants are. <laughs> and I, and I've, I've got a management company that does a really good job for me. And, um, yeah, it's, it's been pretty good so far. And it's, I think what I was sort of seeing with, uh, with, uh, the, 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 the different properties that I sold, uh, with seller financing was that it was, it was awesome to have that passive income. Um, but I, I always knew it was going to end, like it wasn't going to be there forever. <laughs> right. And I, I, I just, I kind of wanted it to be there forever. I didn't want to have to plan on that going away at some point. Uh, and that's, that's kind of that's kind of why I'm doing the rental property thing, just because I know that there is a little bit more trouble tied up with that. I mean, there's more things you have to pay attention to and things you got to take care of. But I mean, if the numbers truly work on the front end, then it's it really can be a hands off investment, and you know, it's a, a positive cash flowing thing over the long term. So, yeah, that's that's great. That's yeah. great. Yeah, I mean, um, it's I definitely still think that when you avoid the uh, the four T's, life is so much simpler. No mm-hmm. tenants, no toilets, no termites, no trash. Yeah. But you know, it's also great to diversify. And you're right, like that's that passive income that never goes away, plus an underlying asset that's hopefully increasing in value. Mm-hmm. You know, phenomenal. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, for all intents and purposes, I I kind of am avoiding that because I don't deal with the tenants and I don't find right. them and I don't, I don't evict them and I don't. I mean, granted, I have to pay for problems when they go wrong, so it's not like I'm totally free of that. And it is—it's just part of the game when you're doing that. You got to be ready to deal with that kind of junk. But, um, but yeah, I, I totally understand what you're saying. I mean, I think, um, I mean, if you wanted to stick to land, that's absolutely viable. It's sure. just the knowledge that at some day those streams of income aren't going to be there, and maybe that's fine. I mean, five, ten, fifteen years—I mean. That's still a really long time to have a stream of income coming in. So yeah, exactly. And then you just keep doing it, and it keeps replenishing, replenishing. Yeah, because it's so fun. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, wow, it's 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 not. Yeah, it's not like I do this and it's just painful. It's like you really do enjoy it, and you get to make a lot of people happy along the way. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we're at that time of the podcast. I'm going to put you on the spot. I know you got a lot of them. What <laughs> is your tip of the week? Sure. You know, um, something that's just on my mind. I was just, I was writing a blog post about this earlier today. So I'm, it's kind of fresh in my mind. That's why I'll say this. But um, I think one thing that I found kind of difficult up front was to knowingly send somebody just a ridiculous offer 
when I knew that they were in a tough spot and they were having a hard time and they needed money. And I just, I kind of felt guilty about that. Almost like, you know, I owe them something more. And, um, I think that's, that's the wrong perspective for people to have. And I guess my tip would be, first of all, don't feel guilty about that because it's not, it's not your fault that they ended up in that situation. Really all you're doing here is you're providing them with a opportunity and it doesn't mean they have to take it. It just means that you're giving them an option. Um, and then also so, something that I learned probably a couple of years into this was just how helpful it can be to just be direct with people. Don't beat around the bush. Don't you know mess around. Just say, look, here's my offer. Take it or leave it. I don't right. really care. <laughs> and it's I think there's a lot of people who have a really hard time just doing the mental battle of, man, like I don't want to tell this person my offer and then it's going to disappoint them and then they're not going to like me. It's like, no, just – this is not emotional. Like all you're doing is you're doing the numbers, you're doing the math, and you're making offers that make sense. And if people don't like that, so what? There's a lot of other people out there that will. You just have to find them. Sure. So, so yeah, I guess I guess what I'm getting at is don't feel bad about it, and don't uh, don't be afraid to just be direct with people and just get to the point and get business done. Great, great. All right, yeah. great tip. Well, my tip of the week is going to be check out Seth Williams' blog. Go to www.retipster.com, and he's got a lot of great resources and phenomenal information out there that can really help take your land investing, your land business, to the next level. And uh, I, I'm really enjoying your blog, Seth. So cool. Well, thanks thank for checking it out. Appreciate that. Yeah, it's great. It's great. So, Seth, are we good? Yeah, we're totally good. All right, great. You're gonna, you gonna come back and, and talk again? I'd love to. Yes. A lot of fun talking to you. So. All right. Great. Great. Well, um, for everybody out there, I just want to remind everyone Vegas is coming up May 30th and 31st. If you haven't booked your flight, you haven't booked your rooms yet, call the office, email me, uh, support at the lane geek dot com or uh, call the 888 number and uh, we'll get you all set up and check out www.thelandgeek.com. Download for free the Passive Income Blueprint. Get the ebook, How to Avoid the Three Fatal Land Buying Mistakes. And of course, get this wonderful podcast delivered each week to your email inbox. And uh, look, give me some love. If you want to acquire some wholesale land, go to FrontierPropertiesUSA.com. And of course, don't forget to check out Seth's blog again at retipster.com. This is Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek. Seth, thanks again. Thank you. And uh, we'll see everybody next week. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Land Geek. Join us next time for more tips, secrets, and information that will help you succeed. Stay connected with The Land Geek on Facebook at facebook.com slash thelandgeek.